Welcome to St. Louis Presents. Debbie, 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 all the signs are in the air and I'm not happy about it. Why? Well, I mean, the, the season is just about over. You know, July 4th has come and gone, the balloon glow, we've had Lou Fest. I what's, know. What's, I mean, summer's about over, right? But don't you love fall? This is such an exciting time of year and the weather we've been having has been absolutely fantastic. And unless you want to stay home all weekend and and be a shut-in. There is so much going on around town at this time of year that it's almost hard to figure out how to fit it all in, don't you think? I do. Are we going like to huh? have no, well, well, that's almost also means yard work, which I've been doing <laughs> a lot of too. So it's a very complicated thing. Well, there's that as well. Of but course. yeah, I love the seasons. There are also a lot of reasons to love St. Louis. And uh, later we're going to uh, we're going to meet a guy from the Goody Goody Diner and find out about the 66 reasons to love St. Louis. Right, and and a big mural that um, you probably see every day to and from work. We're also going to talk to an award-winning author who, if you um, have ever been to Wisconsin's Door County, this is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Yes, this is a mystery. Yes. And it's about uh, some, a couple of World War II vets, I think, and they die of carbon monoxide poisoning, but I don't know, there's something suspicious there. Hmm. And if you, <laughs> <laughs> there's signs that most of us are familiar with seeing the red and white Hilliker signs, because Hilliker is uh, the company that sells a lot of the buildings downtown, commercial properties around the area. So we'll check in with them and see what's new. You're gonna be talking to, to uh, Ben Hilliker. Be sure and ask him about Willie. Willie. His car, Willie. Okay. There's a story there. <laughs> there is. You're always full of uh -huh. stories. All right. Full so all that and more is coming your way on this edition of St. Louis Presents. Stay with us. Well, our first guest is an award-winning writer. She has a background in nonfiction, but has made the leap to fiction. She recently released uh, her second mystery, and it's all about something that happens in the Midwest, about Door County. Please welcome Patricia Skalka. Thanks for being with us. Now, oh, this is the, the Door County Mystery Series, we should point out, okay. and we have book number two. That's do, right. you, do you have a grand plan of how many there may be? The plan is to have six, possibly seven. Wow. And I'm working on the third one now. And, and where? Why this county in Wisconsin? Well, Door County is really unique. It's called the Cape Cod of the Midwest. And we have a map of it right here. It's, <laughs> it's a very, very special kind of place. It's very unlike the rest of the state. My grandmother had a farm in the middle of Wisconsin, and that's all I knew about Wisconsin until I discovered Door County as an adult. And it's spectacular. I mean, it, it was settled first by uh, fishermen and loggers, and now it's a mecca for tourists. They, they get two million visitors a year, many of them from this area and throughout the Midwest, but it's, it's got a unique geographic kind of, of, of arrangement with forests and cliffs and all of this water, and it's a serene, beautiful place, but if you sit there at night and there's no moon and no stars, it gets very creepy, it's very dark. So a lot of murders eerie. up there, or is that just in your <laughs> well, book? Well, <laughs> just in my book. Um, I interviewed the sheriff for the first book, and he said, well, they'd had one murder in 10 years, and I said, I have a few more, but he said, that's okay. And in the second book, there are, uh, it starts with the three gentlemen being found deceased, and it's uh, all of the appearances is that it's an accident. But of course, my protagonist, Dave Kubiak, is always a little bit suspicious. Things, there are certain things that just don't look right to him. And you know, he's, he's, got, you know, he, he's looking for, other, for other clues of what might be going on. And then one of the women, one of the women who was widowed, gets a note that says they got what they deserved. Now, Dave Kubiak, by the way, is a perfect Wisconsin name. That sounds like somebody I would have known when I lived there. And you are right. There are so many people in the St. Louis area who go to Door County every year. It's one of those places that families just generation after generation vacation in. I imagine when you're writing this book about Door County, that becomes one of the characters, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, the, the setting is critical. There are three elements in a mystery. You have your characters, the people, you have the action, the plot, and you have the setting or the place. And all three of them play, you know, work, work together to, to create the story. 
and Door County is just marvelous because you can move from one kind of, you know, you can move from a, from a larger city to a very small village out into the middle of the country, into the forest, and into one of these huge, wonderful parks. And in fact, on the first book, there's a, the picture of the tower, and that tower is coming down this fall because it's been condemned. So, oh, no. oh yeah, I mean, and hundreds of thousands of people have climbed this tower, and and they see it. And now I think the book is a collector's item. Well, the main the main <laughs> character in your book is a guy that used to be a park ranger, right? And well, he was, was a Chicago cop originally. First. Yes, first, and then he re he he left Chicago because he was he he had a very tragic past, and uh, he drank himself out of his job after his wife and daughter were killed in an accident he thought he should have prevented. So he's a very burdened man. He retrains as a park ranger and he's working as a park ranger. And several people die under mysterious circumstances. He knows something's going on, but he just resists getting involved until he has this confrontation. Well, what about these World War II vets? Oh. What happened? Well, I, well, I can't, can't tell you what happened. Read, it's, read it's, the book. <laughs> one of the things about the books that 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 both of them and and in the future books, whatever happens in the present time is linked to something that happened way in the past, decades ago. So it's a matter of unraveling the story and bringing all of this, tying it together, um, because because that's those are the kinds of mysteries I like to read. And so I decided, well, that was what I was going to write. We mentioned at the beginning that you were a nonfiction writer and have made the leap to fiction into mystery. Is that a difficult transition, or is it easier to maybe go from nonfiction to fiction than the other way around? You know, I'm, it was a big leap, and I was a staff writer for the Reader's Digest for about 20 years. So I had a lot of experience doing human interest stories, interviewing people, getting them to talk about what happened, what really happened, and how they felt in these personal crises, which actually aided in writing fiction, because you create characters and you have to give them a story. You know, they have to have something that de they're dealing with, some issues, some problem. And so this experience of interviewing people, you know, sitting in someone's, at their kitchen table or in, in their living room, getting them to really open up and be honest with you helped me in developing characters. So I, I learned a lot. I also developed a thick skin because you get edited very heavily. <laughs> and that comes in very handy no matter what kind of writing you're doing. And when you're writing a mystery, do you, do you have everything planned out ahead of time? Does it ever surprise you what happens in the process? I have it planned out ahead of time. Not all mystery writers do. And yet when I'm writing the book, there are surprises. Characters will do things I don't expect them to do, that I didn't plan on them doing. But what you learn is to have faith in the characters that you develop and you just go with it because their instinct is probably correct. Well, it is book number two. And of course, uh, if you're enjoying the series so far, maybe many more to come. We appreciate you sharing your time with us this afternoon. Uh, it is. Siskalka, and you can see the books that we have right here. Uh, so I can't wait to read them. And of course, now I'm dying to go to a fish boil in Door County. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And when we come back, we are going to tell you more about some great food, some real estate, Lou Fest, and so much more. So stay with us here on St. Louis Presents. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. G morning, sunshine. Wakey, wakey. Text me. Are your parents home later? We can hang. LUV love you. JK. Holla back, holla back, holla back. <laughs> Are you with your friends? That's lame. We're in a huge fight right now. XO. Would you dream of something I did? Are you on your way to the mall? I'm lonely. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. Welcome back. St. Louis is filled with beautiful historical buildings, and my next guest has watched the city evolve in terms of how many of those buildings have been used over the past 30 years. Please welcome Ben Hilliker, the CEO of the Hilliker Corporation. 
Nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm certainly happy to be here. I appreciate it. I've seen the signs for years, the Hilliker signs on buildings downtown, and so it's nice to meet the, the actual Mr. Hilliker. Um, how have things changed over, say, the last 20, 30 years as far as downtown goes? Because it seems like maybe it's gotten slightly easier to get people to want to purchase some of these beautiful old buildings that just need a little love. Well, there's been a seismic change in the uh, interest in downtown. The, uh, it, it's a, a good example would be the buildings typically on Washington Avenue filtering into this core of downtown and west of uh, Tucker that uh, were used in the garment industry in St. Louis. And uh, as the garment industry vacated those buildings, they became uh, really just vacant buildings uh, for the most part. The, um, if you looked at the value of those buildings, let, let's take an example, a building that's uh, five stories tall, 10,000 square feet per level. The, first, the value of that first floor of that building was about $10 a square foot. The value of the upper floors was zero mm. for the reason that if you got someone to lease the space, you were fortunate to get 50 cents a square foot. That would just cover your taxes, insurance, and maintenance. So there was really no value there. Uh, the development uh, into condominiums came about in the late uh, 1980s into the uh, early 1990s, and of course it's still going on today, and this suddenly made these buildings viable again. Uh, the typical sale price of a structurally sound vacant building uh, went to about $20 a square foot, maybe 25 uh, for the first floor, and the 20 to 25 for the upper floors. So this building that I'm speaking of, which had a, originally a value of $100,000, I say originally, in 1985, so now was worth a million dollars in a matter of, of a few years. And, of course, there have been many other changes around the city, the uh, community. Uh, I suppose it's an advantage, too, that many of these buildings, even if they've been vacant for 20, 30 years, were built so well that they can be repurposed again. Certainly, it, it, it costs money, but it can be done because they're structurally they, they well-made. They're, they're well-made, uh, well-built, uh, unless they've been grossly neglected with a re leaking roof that allowed water to come in. Uh, they were uh, in a reasonable shape to work with. Now, I'm sure uh, y you do commercial property, so you're not, Hilliker doesn't sell homes or condos, but probably sell buildings that have become homes or condos. We've sold a lot of the buildings that, that were converted to condominiums, yes. Do you ever, how does it work when someone comes to you? Do your agents, um, do they see what the building could be, or do people come to you and they already have an idea of, we could do this with this building, or do you sometimes have to show them what they could do with it? Well, I'm very proud of, uh, of the creativity of the people who were in our, in our office. But we are fortunate that the St. Louis has a lot of developers who are themselves creative. And uh, between the two, uh, there's, there's a great deal of innovation that goes on. Because one of my absolute favorite buildings that Hilliker currently has listed is the Masonic Temple on oh, Lindell. Yes. And yes. that is a massive building. <laughs> and I know some friends who are in the development business who've looked at it and they are trying to figure out what could we do with this. Mm -hmm. And it is just an amazing, if I had any money or skills, I would buy it and make it my own. <laughs> but <laughs> what, what, do you, um, what do you do with a building like that? Well, the, uh, it could be uh, put to hotel use. It could be put to a uh, use as an office building for uh, a company. The, uh, certainly at the price it is per square foot, they could use a small part of it and just uh, warehouse the balance of the building. Uh, there are uh, institutions that could use it. Uh, the, uh, we've had uh, art uh, museums look at it. And by the uh, way, those pictures you're seeing on the screen right now are of the Masonic Temple, so you can see why I'm obsessed with that place. <laughs> I, I can't see the screen from here. But I, 
Um, yes, yeah, so Hilliker has um, certainly done an amazing job. Do you also do things outside of the city? Because we've certainly been focusing just on, on down, the downtown area, but I imagine you're all over the metro area. Well, we are, and in fact, we do a lot of work at Washington, Missouri, Union, Missouri, uh, St. Clair, Missouri. The uh, St. Charles County, Franklin County, uh, speaking of changes, and increasingly Jefferson County have become an integral part of the uh, St. Louis business community. When Hilliker Corporation was founded, they were outside the business community. Uh, in fact, uh, I used to lease a lot of space in Earth City to firms that wanted to be west along Highway 70 and they wouldn't want to go across the river. They <laughs> we were afraid still? that they would be perceived by their customers of, of having left the community. And um, that's totally changed now. Mr. Hilliker, thank you so much for your time today. Unfortunately, I've run out of time to ask you about Willie, but which Steve said I needed to ask you, so I'll ask you that after the show. But right now, right. <laughs> Steve Bye. has some headline news for us, so let's turn it over to him. Thank you All so right, much. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, Ben's book uh, about Willie the Car is a children's book, and it's really great. You should read it. Well, Mayor Slay has nominated seven people to serve on the city's first civilian oversight board. The board will be responsible for independently receiving and reviewing complaints about the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. The seven candidates were chosen from nearly 50 applications. A few steps will remain before the board is implemented. By early November, the Public Safety Committee will hold public hearings and the Board of Aldermen will vote to confirm each nominee. Training for the confirmed members will take place next spring. The Humane Society of Missouri has launched the first ever Animal Cruelty Task Force Bike Patrol in the U.S. The ACT Bike Patrol consists of two full-time professional animal cruelty investigators on mountain bikes equipped with saddlebags and a trailer to carry equipment and animals. The pair investigate and rescue animals in danger, educate the community about pet care, and promote animal welfare. Humane Society of Missouri President Kathy Warnick says her organization is proud to offer the first bike patrol dedicated to animal safety and community education. And Silver Seas, an odyssey, is now open at the International Photography Hall of Fame and Museum. The photographs of Ernest H. Brooks II give a view into an underwater world that most people will never experience. Brooks often is referred to as the Ansel Adams of underwater photography. He spent four decades documenting the world's ocean environments, and visitors can view the 35 beautiful black and white photographs at the museum through December the 30th. For more information, visit IPHF.org. And this year's annual Lou Fest was a great success. Both days had record-breaking attendance with crowds of more than 25,000 each day. STL-TV's Ben Province was there taking it all in. That's right, Debbie and Steve. Lou Fest is bigger and better than ever. There's a lot more people out here, I think, than last year. Yeah. Uh, but everybody's having a good time. Uh, it's safe and yeah, it's just great music, actually. You can tell it's growing and getting bigger, and that's always good to see. It's, uh, I like the Forest Park location here rather than downtown. It's a little easier, a little more uh, relaxed. You can spread out a little more. So, I mean, it's been nice. It's, there's always bands that I don't know, and there's some bands that I do know, so it's, I don't know, there's just a big variety. It gets better and better every year. It's my first time, and um, I didn't know a whole lot of the bands, but I kind of did a little bit of research on, you know, who I wanted to see, and it has not disappointed, for sure. It's just great to be outside on such a nice day and hear different music. I know some bands from St. Louis are here, too, so that's been fun. How honored are you guys to get to represent St. Louis's music scene, because you guys, are, of course, are from here. Man, it, 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 felt, it felt really good when um, when Lufas actually reached out to our agency and asked us to play. Like I, I think we were all in disbelief because this is this is a really cool festival, and I, I mean, it's it's hard to get into. There, it's it's a small it's a small lineup and a lot of really good bands. You can tell that everybody's having a really good time, and I just I think it's really cool that they do this here. You know, a lot of other smaller cities aren't as lucky to have such a major festival roll through, and. I think people that the people of St. Louis should be very honored and proud to have this.
right, thank you, Ben. Be sure to tune in to Show Me the Music this October for a special Lou Fest episode. For updates, follow Show Me the Music on Facebook. Well, Lou Fest is just one of many reasons to love St. Louis. Philip 66 recently announced 66 reasons to love St. Louis, and the Goody Goody Diner is one of them. Joining us now is the owner of the Goody Goody Diner, as well as a Philip 66 gas station, Ryan Safi. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. It's an honor to be here. You know, I was talking about fall being in the air. Something else is in the air, Ryan. He brought us food. There's food. <laughs> yeah. I smell food. There may be a shot of the food. If it's still there, it may have been consumed during the last break. I'm not sure. But uh, you've got the Goody Goody tie. You brought in all the Goody Goody. Uh, so you own a piece of St. Louis history, essentially. Yes. Um, actually, my brother and my brother-in-law, we bought the diner back in May of 2014. And we bought it from Mr. Richard Connolly, whose father, back in 1954, bought it from a gentleman named Cecil Thompson. And the diner at its current location on 5900 Natural Bridge was the original first A&W root beer stand in St. Louis. So it has a very long history, and now we're honored to be a part of that. I bet a lot of people's parents uh, hung out in the parking lot at one time. Yes, and one of the gentlemen that was <laughs> sitting here before me, Mr. Hilliker, was talking about that when he remembered <laughs> that I believe his father was one of the architects that helped design that location. So St. Louis really is a small community, and you never know who you run into, but it's, a, it's an honor to meet him and to be here as well. So. so is it a coincidence that this Philip 66, 66 Reasons to Love St. Louis mural is, is going up and you, uh, you're kind of on it twice then, aren't you? Is that, well, <laughs> how'd it, that work out, Ryan? It's, at first, when we heard about the, the Philip 66, 66 Reasons to Love St. Louis, we assumed it was something to do with the, the Philip 66 gasoline stations, the Philip's Conoco's. And actually, my son is the one that was like, Dad, no, this has got to do with the diner. It's with, for goody goody. And I was really excited about it because there are 66 different institutions and reasons, uh, hence the name. And I'm assuming they also did it because of the Route 66 uh, uh, historic uh, route on the, in Missouri. And it's just, it was a great opportunity for us to be involved on both sides of that for the simple reason that Philip 66 is willing to invest in the community, put these resources. And unfortunately, with some of the negativity that St. Louis is getting right now, now we have 66 reasons to look at the positives. And what we're looking at a screen is a mural that's, uh, that's up now in Grand Center. It has something to do with this whole promotion, right? Yes, it's a father and daughter team that were, uh, I believe, the first father and daughter team who have created a mural like that in the United States. And it should be completed, and I think they had a ceremony on it uh, around September 11th for that dedication of that. It's Robert Fishbone, and if you'll remember, Debbie, remember the Lindy Squared mural downtown of mm -hmm. Lindbergh? That was his. Yes. I absolutely love this movement that we have in St. Louis of going back to painting on mm -hmm. buildings. I love yes. the murals. I love when you're going down Washington Avenue and you still can see the shadow of the old ads. I just think that's fantastic. So hopefully we'll see see more of these. Maybe we could paint something on the side of the goody goody diner. <laughs> that would be great. I would love that. We definitely that. have space for it. So that would be fantastic. <laughs> now, since you've owned the goody goody for a little over a year, um, you but you do know the whole history, which is very impressive. You probably hear all the time. I mean, people who come in and they tell you about this happened here, or I used to come there. I'm sure you hear stories all the time, right? It is unbelievable when you're able to sit with people who have been coming to that diner for 40, 50, and 60 years, and they start telling you the history that when they were little children, and now they're bringing their children and their great-grandchildren. And it's so humbling to be able to sit with some of these friends and guests. They're not customers anymore. They really have become guests and friends at our diner. And, you know, Mr. Connolly was able to literally take me by the hand, introduce me to so many of the individuals that he's gotten to know over these decades, not just years. And, you know, the staff that we have, I definitely have to give credit to my staff. We are blessed with one of the greatest staffs that I've ever had an opportunity to work with. We have people that have been working there for decades. People have retired from that location. And the way the waitresses, the way the grill line, the prep line, everybody, I don't want to forget anybody, I'll get yelled at when I go <laughs> back. But the way they treat our customers, they treat them like family. They know what the customer is going to order before the customer does there. I mean, it is such a great microcosm of the way I wish the world would be because we have people from 
every walk of life, and they just come in, feel welcome, and I wish there were more places like that. Speaking of ordering, and you were nice enough to bring some food, which I'm going to fight the uh, crew for. <laughs> I have dibs uh, in the cheeseburger, don't touch it. But, you know, about the menu, you know, if you've never even been there and just look at the way the buildings are designed and the name of it, you'd have certain expectations of what the food's going to be like. Yes. And, of course, a business being in, around as long as the Goody Goody Diner was. So uh, what's your philosophy about, you know, being true to the menu and that sort of thing? Real simple. If it's not broke, we don't fix it. And, you know, they are still so guarded about the secret. We had to buy the place before they told us what they put in the <laughs> chicken and the batter. Um, but, no, the, the menu itself remained original. The same cooks, the same grill line, the same foods. And the things that Richard told us that we needed to work on or change for that diner were the open up on Sundays, which we did. We started opening up from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., and increase the parking lot. So we actually bought the building that was next door to us. We tore that down and we extend, uh, expanded the parking lot. But as far as the menu itself, Steve, it is definitely all original. The, uh, we're famous for the chicken and waffles, but the omelets, the eggs, the cheeseburgers, you know, we use certified Hereford beef for our hamburgers as well as our steaks. Our chickens, are, the products that we get in are never frozen. They're always fresh. And we are so true to the recipes that Mr. Connolly and his family you know, instituted and put in place. And we have the original cooks. So they know what they're doing. I stay out of the kitchen. They tell me what to do. When they need something new, I get it and I back off. So. Well, I think it's great because chicken and waffles, of course, has become very trendy. Yes. But you guys have clearly been in on this for years. I believe uh, Mr. Connolly had that going on maybe 10 years or a little longer. Um, <laughs> he heard about it, I think, from Roscoe's. It's another uh, location uh, out of Missouri. But the way he incorporated it and did it at the diner, it just took off. It just so became a part of that institution that people think we've been doing it for 30 or 40 years, but we're very fortunate that it's good. Ryan, do you know much about these other, these, these 60, well, I guess 65 places in addition to Goody Goody? Um, I know some of them are places like the Goody Goody Diner, you know, names we'd recognize. Other places are sort of, uh, you know, maybe not on our radar. Um, they've, they've got the different local breweries. They've got some coffee houses, some of the more familiar names that we're going to do, like the St. Louis Blues, the Fox Theater. And, but it's fascinating. If you go to any of the Phillips 66 gas stations currently, they will have a map. And the map opens up, and it will have all 66 places drawn out in caricatures, similar to what the mural is. But there's going to be family-run businesses, the small Italian places, the small coffee shops, uh, some of the artists. And it's, it's just such a great, diverse group of individuals and business people, Ted Drews, people of that uh, fixture in our community. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you for keeping a St. Louis tradition going, and it certainly gives people more to do. We've been talking about how busy the weekends have been around, but if you find yourself bored, ladies and gentlemen, there you go, 66reasonsstl.com. Just start somewhere and uh, get your list going and start crossing things off, and we are going to go check out the, the chicken and waffles. You thank bet. you. If that's okay with you. Thank you so much. Ryan Soppy, thanks so much for joining us, and we sure hope you enjoyed this edition of St. Louis Presents. We want to thank you for watching and thank all of our great guests and hope you join us next time. We'll see you on Facebook and here on stltv.net.